Christ is risen. Hallelujah. So good to be with you this second uh, Sunday of Easter as we continue to focus on Christ's resurrection. And today, for instance, looking at the gospel of John and the account of Doubting Thomas. And most of us are probably familiar with that story about Thomas, who, who doubted uh, Christ's resurrection because people don't come back from the dead, do they? But they do. And Christ leads the way. He was raised from the dead by his heavenly father. An endorsement of his son's sacrifice for you and for me. So we not only have the forgiveness of sins, won at the cross by the blood of Jesus, but we have the promise of eternal life, which is pointed to us by the resurrection of Jesus coming from the tomb. And people were in mourning. They grieved. Mary Magdalene did that. The disciples were hiding away in fear. Thomas would not, could not believe that Jesus could come back from the dead. He said, unless I put my hands in those nail marks, I won't believe. Well, today we're going to consider that account of doubting Thomas, but also our Old Testament reading in our New Testament reading, as well as the psalm. And the whole thing ties together with this idea of praise the Lord. Taken from our psalm appointed for today, Psalm 148. We praise the Lord. Toward the end of the psalms, the psalmist really focuses on the worship of God and praising God and why and how. We're going to take a look at that today based on our scripture readings and ask this question, how do we praise the Lord? Of course, we do it in worship, like we do every Sunday morning. But in our everyday lives, how do we praise the Lord? Let's, uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the resurrection of Jesus. 
We thank you, Lord, for his death on the cross, that one forgiveness of sins for the entire world and a free gift to be received simply by faith. And even that faith, a gift of the Holy Spirit through the word, through your sacrament, which we also celebrate here today. Lord, help us to understand your presence with us, even today, even this morning in the Lord's Supper. Be with us, always abide with us, Lord, so that indeed we can't help but praise the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Please uh, uh, join in singing our opening praise song. Uh, you could go ahead and uh, be seated for this. Uh, yeah. Jesus Christ is risen today. ourselves and the truth is not in us. And if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Take a moment of silence. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve their present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and make us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of the word, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 
Together we affirm our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, the begotten of his Father before all of us, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not me, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and who was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and who was named man. So he was crucified by the Lord of the Lord's He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and descended into heaven. And sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and Giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and solid church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And our psalm appointed for today is Psalm 148. We read this responsibly. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights above. Praise him, all the angels. Praise him, all his heavenly hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you high heavens, and you waters of all the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for at his command they were created. And he established them forever and ever. He issued a decree that will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. Lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do visit him. You mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds. Kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth. Young men and women, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. And he has raised up for his people and the Lord, the praise of all his faithful servants of the Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. Please be seated. Our next uh, reading is from Acts chapter 5, and uh, I invite you once again to read the fuller account in this in the uh, appointed reading that's available for you back uh, in the entryway to the sanctuary. And here the they re referenced are the apostles following the resurrection of Jesus. <clears throat> Following um, Pentecost, how they were faithful in preaching this good news of the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior that gives us <clears throat> salvation and life, eternal life. And note the emphasis here. They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. And then from 1 Peter chapter 1, we read these words. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power. And then from the Gospel of John, chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, 
with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. We join together with our message song, Jesus, Your Name. just read the account and now I want you to take a look at the video about doubting Thomas. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. Unless I see scars of the nails in his hand, and put my finger on those scars, and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were together again indoors, and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. Put your finger here and look at my hands. 
and reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop your doubting and believe. My Lord and my God. Because you see me. How happy are those who believe without seeing me? In his disciples' presence, Jesus performed many other miracles which are not written down in this book. But these have been written in order that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through your faith in him, you may have life. So let's pose the question. In what aspect of your life, with what you face, what you're dealing with, what, what your preoccupations are, with what your stresses are, your worries are, your priorities are, the stuff of your life, whether you work, you're still working or retired or whatever the situation may be, if you're a student, Whatever your situation may be, where do you doubt? Where do you come along, uh, doubting Thomas, and say, hey, I'm with you, brother. Yeah, I got my own questions here, just like you did. Maybe it's not about the resurrection of Jesus, like Thomas, but maybe it's about something that is in your life or something you're preoccupied or worried about that you just don't see God working, where he's invisible, where he isn't there, where he's dead, just as Jesus was dead to doubting Thomas. Where, where and about what are your doubts? Where are your struggles? Where do you say, okay, I, I, I believe, but I can't go that far? Maybe in theory we say, well, I do believe. Yeah, I believe in the resurrection. I believe God is there, but we don't live like that. We still live in our anxious thoughts, in our worries. Maybe in our guilt. Maybe there are things we just don't believe God really cares about or is actually going to deal with or will provide an answer or maybe a sin or sins that he cannot forgive. He can forgive everybody else or everything else, but he can't do this with my life. I think there's a bit of doubting Thomas in each and every one of us. So let's start with this and then back up from our gospel lesson. But let's start with the end and then go back through this. John, who writes this account in John chapter 20, he summarizes with this. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That same resurrection life that he had 2,000 years ago when he appeared to his disciples. That life is for you and for me. It's for eternity, but it's also for right now. Jesus came that we might have life and might have it abundantly. That's what the word of God says. That is a present tense statement. That means now for each one of us. We are meant to have the blessings of the resurrection now, including peace. Remember, what are the words of Jesus? He repeats this three different times in our gospel reading here. Peace be with you. Let's start with that too. Peace be with you in your life, in your doubting Thomas situations you are facing, in your anxious thoughts, in your troubled soul. Peace be with you. He does not come to judge you. He comes to save you, just as he did not come to judge Thomas, but to actually show him his hands. 
his side, his feet. He's there to encourage us. His words are not words of judgment. His words are these. Peace be with you too. Also. That you may have life. By believing you may have life in his name. Start with that again. In his name. The name of Jesus. Jehovah saves. That's what that name means. The Old Testament name Joshua. The Greek rendition of it, we translate Jesus. Jehovah saves. Yeshua. Jehovah saves. The Christ, another name for Jesus. The Greek word for Messiah, Mashiach, the anointed one. The king come to save us. The king promised in the Old Testament from the time of Adam and Eve and on through the story of Israel, the captivity, the deliverance, the exodus, all of those struggles, the, the, the horrible things that they endured but also did or failed to do. But he, the Messiah, would come and wash away their sins as well as ours. Promised. And the promise is fulfilled. Emmanuel. Another name by which we are saved. Emmanuel, God with us. God with you in each one of your lives, in all of your situations. And again, really there, present, just as he was present with his disciples. Today, we have what we call his real presence in the Lord's Supper, which we will come and physically partake of in the second part of the service. Christ is here now. The Messiah is here now. Jesus, the saving God is here now. Emmanuel is present with us now. All right, to back up, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Psalm 148 says, praise the Lord. And the Bible tells us how and why, and we've already talked about some of this. This is why we praise the Lord. Because he reaches down from heaven to save us, to be with us, to walk with us, to say those comforting words, peace be with you here this morning, today. We cannot help but praise the Lord. Now, of course, praising the Lord, the first thing we think of is worship, don't we? The first thing we think of is actually singing songs songs, for instance, or giving a prayer of thanksgiving. Praise the Lord. Sometimes it's just an expression. Lutherans, maybe not quite so much. <laughs> you know, there's an old uh, cartoon. I, I always remember this. It's a cartoon of uh, this couple, and I think they're Lutherans. <laughs> Older couple sitting in a pew. And a young man in front of them, raising up his arms, praising the Lord. And the wife leans over to her husband and says, quick, call 911. <laughs> We're a little more quiet, a little bit. But we still praise the Lord, don't we? In our way. But sometimes we actually say it out loud. I, I enjoy our newest member, Phil. Uh, and uh, Easter Sunday, I got a couple of praise the Lords out of him. He's sitting there. He's got that Baptist influence, but we, we love him still. <laughs> we don't call 911. <laughs> but praise the Lord. Well, we think of the words. We think of the praising there. But the how and the why. Well, let's take a look at the broader meaning here, too. And here we take a look at Romans chapter 12. And to understand what praising the Lord or, or true worship uh, is really about in a broader sense. And it includes what the psalmist talks about, about praising the Lord. And at the end of the psalm, he talks about, it's interesting, talks about praising the Lord with every single instrument that we have. The uh, wind instruments, the percussion instruments, the horns, the voices, all of it, the stringed instruments. And he itemizes everything and how we praise the Lord. 
But there's this broader meaning and Romans 12, uh, in Romans 12, Paul talks about this. He says this, therefore I urge you brothers and sisters in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your, listen to this, this is your true and proper worship in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. In other words, not killing yourself on some pagan altar. Remember, God did not ask this of anybody, including Abraham with his son Isaac. He stopped him. The only living sacrifice that wound up dead was Jesus himself. God's own sacrifice of himself for us. But we are to be living sacrifices. That's what Paul talks about, Romans 12, 1, where we are to live out the gospel message day by day, moment by moment. And we're to be a sacrifice. This means we hold the things of the Lord before our own interests and priorities and selfishness. We ask the question, first of all, as it's been asked, even for uh, years there was a bracelet, what would Jesus do? Remember that? We start with that. What would Jesus do? What would he say? How would he respond? And it's always unselfish. It's always thinking of God and others first, not ourselves. That's to live it out. That sacrificial way of the cross thinking. That's a heart for the Lord. And it's done not to earn heaven, but Paul says in view of God's mercy, because God has had this mercy for us, for you and for me, in response to that accomplished reality, this, this salvation, which we praise the Lord about, we cannot help also, in addition to praising the Lord, living like that. How can we say no to God who said yes to us? We are a living sacrifice. In view of God's mercy, this is your true and proper worship. So let's keep that in mind as we continue here. True worship. Under number one here, we praise the Lord proclaiming the good news. Proclaiming the good news. This is how we live it out. Now here, this doesn't necessarily mean climbing up on a rooftop and shouting to the neighborhood. Or standing on a street corner. Something like that. For some people, maybe that is how they do this. Probably for most of us, especially Lutherans, we don't do that, right? But each one of us has relationship in our life where we have the opportunity to speak the gospel, to proclaim the good news. It could be a family member who needs some encouragement and we can remind them, hey, you're in God's hands. He loves you. The same God that gave you Jesus, the Messiah, will walk with you through this situation you're facing. And maybe even praying with that person. How about if we pray right now? Let me pray for you. It doesn't have to be fancy. God hears. And pray for somebody. Talk to them. Encourage them. But bring them back. Point them back to the proclamation of the good news. In our verse that we highlight here from Acts, it says, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. You know, and we've even talked about this, about the state of the world today, the culture, that it's always been this way, really. Things change in terms of the particulars of the way the world is dysfunctional. And we complain about current events, current problems, current issues that are loom on the horizon as a dark cloud. But it's always been this way in a fallen world, one way or another. Think about the context of that world in the first century AD in which this book is written, Acts. And here, Acts chapter 5. And what the apostles were living in in their world at that time. 
Now, first of all, it says, of course, they never stopped teaching. And where were they teaching? They were teaching in the exact same place Jesus was teaching in Jerusalem, including the temple in Jerusalem. They were on hostile ground. They were teaching and proclaiming in the same spot where Jesus had and where the enemies of the gospel were. The Jewish religious leaders who had crucified Jesus had gone to Pilate and demanded his death. And these disciples, these apostles, were doing the same thing. And they never stopped. That was courage. They were praising the Lord by proclaiming the good news. Think about this. In that we think it's a secular world today. And we mourn the fact that it's harder and harder, it seems, for Christians to live out and proclaim the good news nowadays. And in some respects, that is true. But think about the culture of the day and the government of the day and what was required. And what was required back then is that people engage in emperor worship, which means that the Roman Empire was supposedly very tolerant. They had uh, temples to all the various gods. They said, hey, you, anybody is welcome to worship any god they want. We'll just include them in the pantheon. They even had a building name, the pantheon, for all gods. You can worship whoever you want with one little qualification, one little asterisk, one little footnote for you. You just got to remember. Always remember to save your ultimate obedience and worship for whom? The emperor. The emperor. And of course, a faithful Christian reserves true worship, ultimate worship for God alone. It was a rough time to be a Christian. Recently watched a special about that Roman world. And we know about the story about the Colosseum and the martyrdom of many of the Christians in the first, second, third centuries of the of that millennium. Yeah, it was tough then too. But they never stopped and neither will we. Well, it wasn't all from the outside either, these problems that the early church faced. They also faced problems from within, heresy. There were all kinds of false teachers and false teachings that arose during that time to challenge the true biblical knowledge of God and his plan of salvation and the story of Jesus. And these heresies attacked who Jesus was and is and what he has done and does do for you and for me. And maybe this is the worst problem of all, the attack from within. But they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news. There's a word for us here. If you want to praise the Lord, if you want to worship truly, never stop. Always look for those God-given opportunities to share the good news with those around you, including family, friends, people we work with, go to school with. Secondly, we praise the Lord, shielded by God's power. And we see Peter talking about this in his first epistle. This inheritance he talks about, this inheritance of salvation, this inheritance of the gospel, this new birth he talks about, the resurrection, including the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says it's an inheritance that can never perish. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who, this last verse here, verse five, who through faith are shielded by God's power. We are shielded by God's power. Even when we don't see it, even when we don't recognize it, even when we feel like we are alone in our struggles and problems. And where is God now? We have angels around us. We have the Lord himself shielding us. 
in ways we will never know until we get to heaven someday, where we will really praise the Lord, seeing clearly then all that he has done, shielded by God's power. We need to have faith about this, that our labor done for the Lord is not in vain and that we are shielded so that we can uh, live out this praise of the Lord reality. I had a conversation this past week with a young mother. And I had uh, visited uh, this past week over um, at Cross Lutheran Church over in Yorkville. And it's a wonderful congregation over there. And they have a, a Lutheran school over there and it has 350 students. 350 students. And I went on Wednesday to chapel service there. And the sanctuary was full of these kids praising God. And they'd break up into small groups and they would pray together with the teachers and parents there with them. And it was a wonderful, uplifting experience. And it's a reminder to us too that there are some things really worth fighting for in our praise the Lord, worship, reality, and life that we have, including our congregational life here together about the potential and the possibilities. Yes, even today for outreach and the proclamation of the gospel and the teaching of young children. And we're doing it right here at this church, at this congregation. Diana with the preschool and today there's an open house and we need to pray that God blesses that outreach there. This is some, something worth supporting, something worth courageously defending and keeping it going, whatever the cost may be. This is part of our praise the Lord life. And we're shielded by God's power in this. But I had a conversation after my visit there at Cross Lutheran with a young mother. And I was sharing with this young mother how special it was at Cross Lutheran and saying, gee, you have a couple of young kids here. Maybe it would be good to consider sending them to Cross Lutheran because they live in that area down there. And her response was this, and it's very sad because this is a Christian mother. And she said, well, uh, my husband and I, we talked over this and we think we wanna send them to public school. Now, there are many good public schools. I wanna say that there are many good, fine, dedicated public school teachers. So don't mishear me here. Don't draw the wrong lesson here. But here's the point. There are some things that should be considered for certain families. And this young couple, they made a decision that they're going to send their kids to public school for this reason. We want our kids to feel comfortable with the culture. And we want to have them in an environment that is non-judgmental. And she used that word non-judgmental about three or four times in the conversation. Now, I wasn't being judgmental about anything in that conversation, but here's the point. The world today and the culture of today looks at Christians, Christianity as being judgmental simply because we have a distinct belief. For instance, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. How many of us here believe that? Well, the world's conclusion is, is if you believe that, therefore you are excluding other philosophies and other religions, and also you are judging those as being wrong and in error, and therefore you are the problem. And this young couple, they don't want to have to deal with that. Do we have an issue here? Do we have a, a problem here? Here's a fundamental question. Is what we read about in the Bible true or not? And is the crucifixion real? Is the resurrection real? Did Christ really rise from the dead? These are important distinctions. And increasingly we see in the culture that the Christian faith and the culture are doing this. They're separating. And it's getting harder and harder even to carry on a conversation 
without somebody shutting us off and saying you're being judgmental. Well, we're not being judgmental. We want to see the world saved, people saved. And you don't solve the issue by going along with the stream of consciousness and worldly conviction that is opposed to the word of God and God himself in the gospel, the proclamation that we have. We don't solve it by turning our eyes away from the truth. At some point, we have to make a stand and say, no, this really is true, and it's worth fighting for. And our children are important enough to provide this opportunity for them to have this salvation, this gospel, this Jesus, this Emmanuel, this real presence, this hope, this love. It was said in this early church that faced so many different problems. It was said even by the secular historians at the time that people were really attracted to Christianity because they saw how these Christians loved one another and how they truly lived out that love for their neighbors as well, as well as for God. There's much ugliness in the world today. Do we need more or less of our proclamation, including for our children? I was talking to Diane even this morning about what her plans are for the preschool here. We need to support this. This is hands-on, boots-on-the-ground stuff here, folks, that you and I have a responsibility for in our praise the Lord, worshipful existence. We're shielded by God's power, though, in this. God already has his plan for this place. Let's be part of that, trusting him. Finally, number three, we praise the Lord, peaceful in his risen presence. Peaceful in his risen presence. That's the word here that we see. That's the takeaway from the story of the disciples and doubting Thomas here. It's down here in verse 30. Jesus performed many other signs in what? The presence of his disciples. These other things not even recorded in this book, John says. An amazing account of the greatness of God and his Messiah, Jesus, the Son of God. And we may be tempted to think, well, that was great back then. I wish I could have been there with Doubting Thomas, so I could have put my hands in the marks of the nails and touched Jesus myself. Then I would be stronger in my faith if I could have that experience. Well, we see the truth, though, here, that the strength of our faith and our belief comes from what Jesus himself says about it. Jesus says, verse 29, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That's us. But we do see. I've seen and you've seen the people in your life, in my life, who have been faithful followers of Jesus. And we, at the end of the day, looking at them and comparing and contrasting with what we see in the world as an alternative, to that life of faith, we say, no, I don't want that world. I want that life that this person has. And some of us, like myself, we may be blessed to have that example in our own parents. And I took a look at my parents and their marriage and their life and their ethic and their morality and their spirituality. And I said, that's what I want. That's the truth. They grew up in homes that had tremendous problems. When they met after World War II, they made a vow to each other that their children would never have to endure what they had. And so they raised me and my sister and my brother in the faith, gave us that Christian education, gave us that grounding, that presence. We have it. And again, even today, with the Lord's Supper, this is going to be real strength with that real presence for each and every one of us and cause us to praise the Lord. Well, 
You know, I've quoted uh, Winston Churchill before. And uh, I'll finish with this. When we consider how to praise and why to praise the Lord with our lives. Winston Churchill, um, he, when he was a young man, uh, he went to a school called Harrow. And uh, later on, when he was prime minister of Great Britain, in 1941, he visited his old alma mater, Harrow, uh, to speak there. And back then, they had traditional songs that they would sing. And he noticed that uh, they had added a verse to one of these songs, that uh, one of these school songs. We'll get back to that in a minute. But first of all, his speech that he gave when he was there at Harrow visiting. And this is a year after the dark days of 1940 in the Battle of Britain. And now, even though it's still early in the war, uh, the tide had, was starting to turn and hope was beginning to dawn again for the British people. And this little excerpt from his speech to the students at Harrow, he said this, but for everyone, surely what we have gone through in this period and I am addressing myself to the school here. Surely from this period of 10 months, this is the lesson. Never give in. Never give in. Never. 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 In nothing, great or small, large or petty. Never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to force. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. There's a spiritual application for us in the church militant that fights the good fight. So here's that verse that they added at Harrow that Churchill noted. It says this, not less in we praise in darker days the leader of our nation and Churchill's name shall win acclaim from each new generation. For you have power and dangers our, our freedom to defend, sir. Though long the fight, we know that right will triumph in the end, sir. And we Christians, we substitute the name of Churchill. We put in Christ's name. And Christ's name shall win acclaim from each new generation. May we be faithful in praising the Lord so that happens. Amen. We pray. Father in heaven, we pray for our country. We pray for our world going through its troubles. We pray, Lord, that we would be faithful in our proclamation of the good news. We pray, Lord, that we would rest in your power always. We pray, Lord, that we would always abide in your wisdom presence. Lord, we pray for continued direction for our congregation. We pray for uh, our families. We pray for our children. We pray, Lord, for uh, the open house today. We pray, Lord, that people would come and that uh, the doors would be open in these families to have a Christian education for their children and that we might be part of that. Lord, we pray for healing for those who need it. We pray for Dottie, Stephen, Greg, Julie, Mary, Ann, Jean, Steve, Mary, Carol, Ray, Malia, Keith, Ken, Bob, Bart, Jerry, uh, Joan, Isaiah, Griffin. Lord, we pray for comfort for John and his son and the rest of uh, Joan's family. Joan Gaberson passed away. We pray for comfort there. Lord, we pray for the family of Maggie, uh, who passed away. Lord, in our losses, uh, including recent losses, we pray for your comfort um, in, in, in those. May we always hold fast the promise of the gospel and the resurrection life that we have at last forever. Now, Lord, we sum up all of our prayers in preparation for receiving your real presence in the Lord's Supper. We pray that prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to the temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We join together in our communion song. <clears throat> Same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. I invite you to come forward to the Lord's table. Welcome to the Lord's table. Technique. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Give me the for you. Just 
May this true body and true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep and preserve me steadfast in the true faith and life of Christ. The part of his peace. Amen. shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and may he always give you his peace. Please stand for our closing song.
Um, of course, Lutheran Church Charities is still our mission of the month, so we're still collecting donations for them all month long. There's a little basket in the back. Um, the Bibles are out there if anybody would like to sign them for our two preschoolers that will be going off to kindergarten. I have their names in there. If you want to just write them a little message or just sign your name, whatever you'd like to do. Um, just thought a nice little token to give them as they go off to kindergarten. Um, we do have our May 21st is our preschool graduation day. I'm expecting about, you know, 60 people again to come for their graduation. So we're very excited for that. Um, of course, Pastor Lee did mention we're having our open house today at noon. I didn't have like any sort of registration or anything like that. So I'm hoping some families show up. Uh, you never know. We've been sharing it away. So um, just continue to pray for that. Like we do have five students starting in the fall with a six starting um, next February when she turns three. So we have a good number so far. Um, transition team, we have been talking to two pastors. One pastor is in Louisiana and one pastor is in Minnesota right now. Um, so we are continuing the call process and just talking to them and seeing how they feel and if they'd like to continue to talk to us, we'll have some additional Zoom meetings with them. So we will keep you up to date on all of that as we continue to go through that. Um, and then lastly, just VBS, we have 30 feet, 33 kids registered already um, with a couple of volunteers. So just continue to help us share the word for that, but we're looking forward to another fun VBS this year. And other than that, um, wave to the camera. And we did bring some goodies, even though Christy's not here to bake for us today. So <laughs> there are some goodies out there. So have a good week, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.